Coming up on Chopper's Politics. Why did the government go through all of the political flack it got for scrapping the aid target only to bring it back later? Either you think it's the right thing to do or you don't. Welcome to Chopper's Politics. Those listening carefully will have already clocked I am not Christopher Hope. Chopper is taking a well-deserved break after running the marathon and celebrating his 50th birthday. So you're joining me, Lucy Fisher, The Telegraph's deputy political editor, in the podcast hot seat this week as Rishi has dished out his budget. 2024. But today I can announce that flights between airports in England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland will, from April 2023, be subject to a new, lower rate of air passenger duty. Draft Relief will apply a new, lower rate of duty on draft beer and cider. It will apply to drink surf... The independent, low-pay commission brings together economists, business groups and trades unions. The government is accepting their recommendation to increase the national living wage next year by 6.6% to £9.50 an hour. On Wednesday, the Chancellor Rishi Sunak set out the government's tax and spending plans for the year ahead. While many aspects of his spending spree had been pre-announced in the press, there were plenty of surprises left for the day itself. The bigger picture was a stark increase in government spending, as the size of the state has been permanently expanded even further. The tax rises announced this year are meanwhile the largest in almost three decades. As for consumers, there was a striking array of winners and losers. Fans of the pub will be pleased to see three pence knocked off a pint of draft beer, Workers on low incomes will be grateful for a rise in the national living wage to £9.50 an hour, and frequent flyers will enjoy the air passenger duty on flights being halved. Now we've let Sunak's statement sink in, we can take a more considered deep dive into what was announced yesterday and exactly how all of it affects your wallet. Joining me to crunch the numbers are The Telegraph's Whitehall editor Harry York and columnist Juliet Samuel. Hello to you both. Hi there. Hi. So, in many ways, it was quite a radical and far-reaching budget. Uh, High tax, high spend. Simon Clarke, the Treasury Chief Secretary, has already marked it out as a philosophical shift in Conservative thinking. What was your take, Juliet? Well, I wouldn't necessarily call it a philosophical shift so much as a political shift towards an assessment of what the public wants slash what will they think may win them an election in a few years' time although I think that calculation may not be as accurate. But essentially, what was really striking about this budget was that, yes, taxes went up, as we might have expected to pay for the massive hangover of COVID debt, but then they actually went up more than they needed to for that, and spending returned back down to a much higher level than it had been before COVID. And so this was a political decision, essentially, to permanently expand the size of the state and to do so with a little bit of uh, language to try and keep the uh, more Thatcherite Tory base happy, but essentially uh, in a quite striking way to base the state around the needs of an aging society and to essentially pile more and more of the burden onto the working population and young people to pay for for the needs and and benefits of the elderly. All in, that doesn't sound very conservative, does it, Harry? What are you picking up from Tory MPs about what, what they thought of the budget yesterday? I think by and large, uh, a lot of Tory MPs are very receptive to what the Chancellor has announced. You know, we're effectively talking 150 billion of additional spending over the spending review period for three years. Um, That's real terms increases across government departments. It's more money for public services. So they're they're very pleased with that because, you know, we're seeing a shift in, you know, I do think there is a shift in how the Conservative Party is approaching tax and spend now. Um, People have talked about Gordon Brown versus George Osborne. I think economists are right to say this does feel very much like Brown. Um, You know, this is investment in public services whilst actually not cutting taxes, despite what the Chancellor is actually trying to get across. He says he wants to be a low-tax Chancellor. He wants to cut taxes on working people. But there's no actual evidence of that in this budget. 
Um, so, so there is a degree of that. I think that some of the more kind of fiscally conservative, traditional backbenchers are a bit concerned about the size of the state. You know, they don't see this coming down, despite what the Chancellor is saying. Um, they don't see taxes coming down. So I think at the moment, a lot of these Red Wall 2019 intake MPs, they'll be very pleased with this. I think some of the more veteran experienced MPs will be starting to think, well, we need to really start showing that we're conservatives here. And, you know, next couple of years, we need to start doing stuff on tax. Yeah, I think that's interesting, you pointing out the mismatch between the rhetoric of the Chancellor saying he wants to be uh, a low-tax Chancellor, show some kind of fiscal restraint, and what we got yesterday. And certainly for my part, talking to some Tory MPs on the right of the party, they were very glad to see that the um, OBR is forecasting growth this year has been better than expected. The forecast for scarring on the economy from the pandemic is uh, has been reduced in their estimation. And I think some MPs um, would have liked to have seen some of that extra fiscal headroom used for tax cuts rather than extra spending. So uh, I think that the pressure is on the Chancellor uh, in the next budget to, to possibly um, look again at that balance. Um, obviously, we're just um, three days out now from the COP26 climate change summit. So I wanted to ask you both about the environmental dimension to the budget. Um, perhaps no surprise that we saw um, fuel duty frozen for the 12th year in a row, given that um, petrol is at a record high price at the moment. Difficult to raise that. But the Chancellor's decision to slash air passenger duty for internal flights, what did you make of that, Juliet? It's a complete contradiction in terms of the government's policy on what it says it wants to do on net zero and then what it's actually doing. And this runs across a lot of themes, particularly, for example, living standards uh, to do with personal tax, inflation and rising wages. But on green issues, it's particularly striking because, as you say, they've slashed air passenger duty, but not just slashed it. They've also changed the composition of it so that short-haul flights are less severely taxed and long-haul flights are more severely taxed, when in fact it's short-haul flights that are much less uh, efficient in terms of fuel use and pollution and which contribute by far the greatest to carbon emissions. The fuel duty freeze I mean, as you say, it's been done for a dozen years and this year uh, fuel has massively increased in price. So perhaps that's not very surprising. But the other element of this that I think is very striking is the fact that capital spending, although fairly high by historic standards, is going to go up to, I think, an average of 2.7% of GDP um, under the, the cap that the government set of 3%. Given what the government has said it wants to do, which is transform the entire economy to be based on electric, uh, low carbon fuel, it's actually not that, it's not planning to actually spend very much money to get towards that in historic terms. So if we're going to see electric charging stations everywhere, new nuclear power plants, where the hell is all that going to come from? Uh, And so we've had a lot of rhetoric and really not much substance that goes in the same direction. Yeah, I I think that's a very important question. I mean, Harry, you, you know a lot about the tension that's existed between the Treasury and Downing Street over the Prime Minister's net zero proposals in recent months, don't you? Yeah, no, I, I think it's interesting what Juliet was saying about the contradiction here between rhetoric on climate and action. I think on air passenger duty, you know, the Treasury saying they've estimated that this is cost uh, carbon neutral rather than cost neutral, I should say. It's actually going to cost them money um, to do this change. I'd, I'd like to see they're working on that because, you know, as Juliet was saying, you know, the most environmentally polluting part is the, is the short haul flights. What we're trying to work out, I guess, is amongst all the different competing agendas and priorities in the government, what actually sits at the top of the pile. You know, climate change is a big pressing issue at the moment because we're hosting COP26. But if you actually look at what they've done here, this is all about union connectivity. That's what they're trying to make it about. It's it's about making sure people from Teesside can get to London quicker and cheaper, and, and likewise in Belfast and Edinburgh. So that that is a kind of contradiction. It does feel as though you know they keep saying all these warm, warm words about the climate, but then when something else equally pressing comes up, then it's kind of an inconvenience that they move to the side. And, and they're just on the wider issue. I I do think if you look at you know the the chancellor's approach in the last six months or so there is there is a tension there between him and the prime minister on the climate because the chancellor knows the cost 
Um, whereas the Prime Minister, as we know, is a big spender and he doesn't have to worry about how all these promises are going to be funded. Um, and there wasn't huge amounts on climate in that budget or spending review. They've done a bit of that with the green bonds, etc. But yeah, not much to speak of there. And, and I think this will continue to play out in the coming years of this parliament, that tension between number 10 and number 11. And it'd be very interesting to see in the next two to three years how much, you know, will we see things like carbon taxes? Number 10 says we won't. Uh, will we see other green levies? It, it, it's it's hard to know at this stage. Yeah, interesting. A, a lot more to uh, to talk about in coming months on that subject. Um, so just looking at some of the more consumer aspects of the budget, Harry, booze was obviously a, a big theme, um, an overhaul of alcohol taxes, the biggest in a very long time, more than 140 years. We know that the Chancellor's a teetotaler, but He's announced this uh, draft beer duty cut. We know that the sparkling wine, champagne, Prosecco, Carva is going to become cheaper, more in line with still wines. What do you think? Is this, is this a clever, popular move with voters or is it or is it a bit of a cheap bauble? Yeah, no, this is what, you know, this is what is impressive about the Chancellor. He's found something that, you know, on the face of it, you know, looks great. People will be talking about it. Um, you know, when they pick up the paper this morning, they'll be talking to their family and friends about it. In, it's not a huge change, but... What he's doing is ticking lots of boxes. It's a very consumer-friendly change. You know, it knocks free pee off a pint and, uh, as you say, sparkling wine. Um, It's also the kind of Brexit dividend because, you know, it's a reform that we can do now because we've left the EU because of the way unit taxation was structured before. We can now change that. So, yeah, in essence, it's not a massive change, but it's been sold very well. And, uh, you know, it will leave people with a positive impression of the Chancellor. Uh, And that's what he's very good at and has been doing ever since he stepped into the role. And Julia, I just wanted to ask you about inflationary concerns. Obviously, if inflation rises and interest rates rise, that is a big problem for the state and the cost of servicing public debt. But what about homeowners? I mean, how concerned should the government be about those people with mortgages if we do see an interest rate rise in the next few years? That could be a huge drag on the economy because it's in most households, it's the biggest item is the mortgage payment. And if rates for that start to go up, which they already have, that's going to take a big chunk out of people's ability to spend and out of the how they feel about their living standards. So inflation, which is the risk behind this, is really, it's not something the government can directly do a lot about. And essentially what they're hoping is that the price rises that we're seeing this year are a temporary phenomenon. And there's some reason to believe that that's true. For example, the big shipping pile up around the world that has seen ports blocked and the cost of shipping skyrocketing, that should be a temporary phenomenon. It should work its way through the system sometime next year. Hopefully, gas prices will likewise come down after the winter. Uh, But what we don't know is whether actually in the the post-COVID, post-Brexit economy that emerges from the dust next sometime next year, whether the steady state of that is actually going to be a higher cost economy um, with higher wages that are actually competing with inflation uh, as to whether they rise raise living standards. And we don't know whether there's going to be a, a big structural uh, labour shortage that leads to inflation really embedding itself in the economy, uh, which will be a huge problem for, for interest rates ultimately and, and therefore for the cost of living for everyone. So there's a lot of risks that the Chancellor didn't really go into much in his speech um, that he's essentially hoping will blow over. It's quite a worrying picture you present uh, for the government and for ordinary families. Um, Harry, there was more bad news for households on council tax, wasn't there? Yeah, there was. I mean, if you look at the OBR figures buried in that very lengthy document, what you see is that over the next uh, five years, there's going to be some very kind of steep increases year on year in how much councils will be increasing council tax by. So we're looking at at least... Uh, 3%. Um, that's the limit that the government has allowed councils to raise uh, their rates by per year before holding a local referendum. Um, and the OBR says that if you take the forecast period from 2019 to 20 through to 26, 27, what you're talking about is £12.1 billion of additional tax receipts that could be raised. And they think that councils will seek to max out on that flexibility the government's given them. And the reason for that is quite simple. 
you know, when people heard about the, the health and social care levy that the Prime Minister announced earlier this year, they probably assumed, oh, great, you know, our social care problems are going to be taken care of because the Chancellor and the Prime Minister are whacking up our national insurance contributions. That's £12 billion of extra revenue a year. Surely that will alleviate the problem. Well, in fact, only £3.6 billion of that £12 billion a year is going to councils in the first three-year period, and only £200 million of that is next year. So what you have is... You have councils who are already stretched. The funding grants don't really go far enough for all the competing financial pressures they're under. And they've got very little money from that social care levy to play with to begin with. So they then have to plug the gaps um, until that levy starts to transition over from the NHS to social care. And that is why you're going to see steep increases. Even though the Chancellor hasn't done any major revenue raises in in the budget, you know, increasing income tax, going for NICS again or VAT, what you will see is people's other bills will start to go up. And it is effectively a kind of stealth, you know, increase, um, albeit done at the local government level rather than at central government level. I think the other notable thing about this budget and the government more generally is that if you look at OBR forecasts for how the economy is going to grow, what state we're going to settle in after COVID. At the moment, we're seeing a big bounce back from the pandemic, but then growth is expected to settle down to just over 1% of GDP, which is essentially very, very weak. And there doesn't really seem to be any big message from the government or plan to address that. That seems to just be accepted. There isn't a big program where the government said, look, we've got this problem of weak growth. And frankly, growth is the key to all of this because it funds the spending, it determines living standards, it determines national prosperity. There isn't a any kind of measures to address that issue. It just appears to be something that we're, we're all meant to accept. And uh, when you couple that with the fact that working people, the working population, and particularly graduates are going to be taxed more and more to pay for social care, to pay for health care, which is generally being used more and more by the elderly. You start to see a country that's essentially mortgaged its future to rather than uh, having people pay for their care using their huge housing wealth, for example, we're just going to tax the young to pay for it. And I think That really is quite a depressing and bleak picture of where the economy is headed, that despite the optimistic rhetoric is a reality that's going to hit the government at some point. I'm sure that's something we we will hear more about um, in in coming days as the dust settles on this budget and people look at the the bigger picture. I mean, one of the, the Chancellor's sort of big rabbits, Juliet, was the business rate cut, 7 billion cut in total. It, it sounds from that that you're not totally convinced that that will catalyse the economy in the way the Chancellor hopes. Well, I think if you're going to do something on business rates, fine to, to cut them. I mean, essentially, business rates are a pernicious tax. They're pretty regressive. They are based on the value of properties. They're unfair because bricks and mortar properties pay them online doesn't. And this prospect of an online sales tax, I mean, God knows how that's going to work, how they're going to nail down taxes from multinationals that can base themselves anywhere and send products uh, to wherever they like across the country. So, you know, the only radical thinking on business rates that we've seen was actually from Labour at their conference. It was the one substantial policy that Labour actually announced was to just abolish business rates, which if you're going to really go for growth and look at the burden and the fairness of taxation across the economy seems to me a much more appropriate and and radical measure to to take. And Harry, what's your view on on the growth picture, growth forecast for the country? You know, we've heard from the Chancellor, him talking up the UK becoming this science and technology superpower. He certainly tried to put the best spin on the investment into infrastructure upgrades uh, and research and development. What's your take? Well, I actually agree with Julietta going back to that issue about young people and the taxation burden on the young and graduates. And I think actually one of the big structural weaknesses in the economy, if you actually look at the picture, uh, and other economists have identified this, is, is wage growth. There is very minimal wage growth predicted for the next few years. And the IFS have actually looked at this and said, if you if you compare the picture to the last financial crash, um, you know, wages should be 
um, by 26, 27, 40% higher than when they're forecast to be. And that's a massive squeeze on people's living standards, especially when you've got inflation running potentially as high as 4.4%. And, and young people are coming into jobs now uh, at entry level on the same wages that people were coming into those jobs 20 years ago. Meanwhile, they're paying back these these uh, 9% rate on student loans, higher national insurance contributions, higher income tax, etc. And that does have a drain on, on, on the economy overall if those people aren't progressing up the pay scale fast. And ultimately, that will then feed through into receipts and, and so forth. So I do think that's a big problem. And I haven't heard any government really in the last 10 years address that issue. And then you've also got the issue of the housing shortages still and we, st- we still have a big problem with young people being unable to get on the property ladder and again you know the, the chancellor has announced a bit more money for for brownfield land but th- that issue hasn't been addressed adequately as far as i can see i think throughout the podcast we, we've touched on some of the problems facing particularly hard up families as we head into winter uh, energy prices going up petrol prices being high wages struggling to keep pace with inflation, shortages on, on the shelves and supply chain issues that could that could impact families. Uh, it was some of the, the positive moves announced by the Chancellor to try and ease that burden yesterday were, of course, um, a change to the taper rate of the universal credit benefit and a rise in the national living wage. Uh, Harry, how much do you think that that will help you know, poorer families? And is this going to be an attack line that Labour is really going to build some momentum on as the winter progresses? I think Labour will try and make some capital out of it. All I would say is, you know, that that £20 uplift, um, it was a big decision at the time. The Chancellor was very mindful of that because he knew how hard it would be to take that money back off. So what they've done with the taper rate is they've tried to compensate. Um, You know, it's a £2 billion injection to try and make universal credit more uh, generous. It's about trying to incentivise work. It does really only benefit people who are in work, though, so it doesn't really help those that are out of work. That's and, right, and it's worth saying, isn't it, that the majority of people on universal credit are not in work. Yeah, exactly. So so it, it's, not, it's nowhere near as generous as what they had in place during the pandemic. And the only thing I'd say about Labour is they will try and exploit it, but they don't really have a firm position on universal credit. You know, under Jeremy Corbyn, it was uh, a case of we will scrap universal credit. Now it's a case of we'll fiddle around the, the edges with it. So I think it'd be quite easy for the Chancellor probably to come back to them on that and also Labour is starting to slip back into the old habit of making spending pledges again without saying how they'd fund them Um, you know they still haven't set out how they're going to pay for social care so uh, I think it's if they're going to do that they need to come up with a you know clear funding formula for all of these things. And Juliet one last question to you Um, uh, interesting that the Chancellor talked about the 0.7% of gross national income target for overseas aid spending coming back by 2024 Um, obviously means that the cut to the aid budget will remain in place for three years. What do you make of him uh, him making that announcement? I just think it's rather bizarre. Why did the government go through all of the political flack it got for scrapping the aid target only to bring it back later? Either you think it's the right thing to do or you don't. Uh, And particularly with just the public finances under so much pressure ultimately from COVID plus the burden of ageing and the fact how unpopular this target is and how dubiously spent a lot of aid money is and uh, how big a question it is over how much good this money does. I think it was a, a really odd decision and an unnecessary one. Interesting. He may yet uh, receive more flack over that in coming days. Well, that's all from this budget special of Chopper's Politics. Chris will be back next week, and I'm sure he'd love to return to an inbox chock full of your reaction to some of the Chancellor's announcements. Were you pleased by the threepence saving on the price of a pint? Are you worried about your mortgage repayments rocketing? Let Chopper know by emailing chopperspolitics at telegraph.co.uk or tweeting at Chopper's Podcast. Thank you to my guests, The Telegraph's own Harry York and Juliet Samuel. And if you'd like more expert analysis from Juliet, Harry or me, and you're not already a Telegraph subscriber, head to www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash chopper to get your first month free. Thank you to the producers, Giles Gear and Louisa Wells. But most importantly of all, a big thanks to you for listening. As Chopper would say, until next time, cheerio! Cheerio!